Brock Lesnar has been one of the biggest attractions in combat sports since making his WWE debut in 2002 and signing with the UFC in 2008. A spectacle of pure mass and athleticism, Brock's sheer size mixed with his ability to move like a lightweight captivated audiences, and Brock was able to match this theatrically to create a persona the masses could grip onto. I'm coming for you, motherfucker! His larger-than-life presence, Brock would become one of the highest-paid athletes in WWE and UFC history. However, none of this would have been possible if not for the hardships endured before fame and money, as it was Brock's pursuit of an NCAA D1 wrestling title that allowed him to leverage his likeness into post-collegiate superstardom. Follow along as we break down Brock's story, going from a small-town kid on a farm in South Dakota to one of the highest-paid heavyweight combat athletes of all time. Brock Lesnar was born and raised in Webster, South Dakota on his parents' dairy farm. Growing up in a small farm town, most kids in Webster couldn't even participate in sports as they had to work on their family farm instead. Brock's family was also not well off, and in fact, Brock's reiterated many times that his family was dirt poor. However, Brock's parents sacrificed their time and money so their kids could participate in sports. And starting at age five, Brock began wrestling. Brock's mother would drive him all over the tri-state of South Dakota, North Dakota, and Minnesota for competitions. And it didn't take long for wrestling to become Brock's main outlet in life. Brock's parents would instead still in him that he was supposed to win, and it was expected. When he lost, he simply had to remember that feeling of losing and to just go win the next one if he didn't want to feel that way again. It was tough love, but Brock attributes this to what formed his mindset when it came to competition. Outside of wrestling, the only life Brock knew was the dairy farm, but even at a young age, Brock was certain he had much bigger dreams than the Lesnar acreage. Brock's first attempt at leaving the farmstead came when he joined the National Guard after his junior year of high school. Inevitably, Brock would be discharged from the military due to having partial color blindness. However, according to Brock, the training he underwent for the National Guard was a pivotal moment in his life. Brock has two older brothers and has been on the record stating that in Webster, the Lesnar brothers were known as fighters, often getting into scuffles around town. Reflecting on his time with the National Guard, Brock said, the National Guard changed my life. I was 17 years old, I was Mr. Know-it-all, and I didn't respect myself or authority. Then I entered the guard. Those f straightened my ass out right away. After coming back from the National Guard with the new perspective, Brock would lock in for his final year of high school. One of the things that needs addressed is the progression of Brock's size and athletic ability through these years. The most glaring attribute of Brock Lesnar is that he is an absolute unit. Brock Lesnar is a six foot three, 275 pound mountain of anger. The alpha male of our species, Brock Lesnar. Yeah! Damn, those guys are big. Yeah, Look at that brink card girl. That, oh, she was so young. Which one was that? Gorilla. He was a gorilla, son. Jesus. Today, he stands at 6'3 and weighs somewhere around 285 pounds. The evolution to this monster was not complete, even by his senior year of high school, but it laid the groundwork that would make him become one of the most dangerous heavyweights of all time. In seventh grade, Brock wrestled at 103 pounds. By his freshman year of high school, he wrestled at 152 pounds. His junior year, he wrestled 189 pounds, and by his senior season, he made for a light heavyweight, weighing 210 pounds in the 285-pound weight class. Brock claims this huge swing in weight was an advantage for his wrestling at heavyweight. If he had always been bigger, he would have probably skated by on strength and size alone, and not developed technically. According to Lesnar though, spending those years wrestling lighter weights made his style of wrestling more active and dynamic, giving him a level of athleticism that was extremely hard to match for most heavyweights, and would captivate those witnessing. Boom, boom, and ah, ah, and people were literally like, you could hear them kind of in an uproar, and I looked. Regardless, after finishing third at the South Dakota State Tournament his junior year, Lesnar would end his senior year finishing third once again. With D1 college coaches not exactly busting down doors for a South Dakota kid who finished third, Brock would take his talents to Bismarck State College, where he would compete in the National Junior College Athletic Association. In his freshman year at the Junior College National Tournament, Brock would have another pivotal moment in his life. In the quarterfinals, he would lose to a wrestler that according to Brock was a pudgy no-name. Brock would go on to finish fifth, but that specific loss to that specific fat kid shook Brock to his core. After that loss, Brock vowed to become the biggest and baddest version of himself he could be. And as he puts it in his book, just start crushing these f He'd return to Webster for the summer, where every day he would work as a laborer for a local power company, and after he would hit the weight room with a couple of his friends. He trained relentlessly that summer, and would go from 226 pounds to 258 pounds, and was still flexible and fast. After that summer, Lesnar claimed he truly believed he could do anything he wanted in life. 
Brock Lesnar was nearing final form, and his sophomore year would be when a lot of people would take notice of him. At the Bison Open, an early season tournament that is typically D1 wrestlers, Lesnar would roll through the heavyweight bracket, and that would be when Jay Robinson and the Minnesota Gophers wrestling staff would notice Lesnar. Brock would be flown out to Minneapolis for a visit immediately, and he knew right away once he got to the city, he had found his new home. It was one of those deals that if you don't get him right away, he's going to be out there and people are going to know who he is and then you're going to be fighting everybody. Truly, the, the next day, we flew Brock to campus because it was right during the signing period. Within the course of five days, he's a gopher. Brock would sign with Minnesota before returning back to Bismarck, and he would go on to be 36-0 that year, winning a JUCO national title at heavyweight. Brock would enter the Minnesota lineup midway through the next season, and Brock was set solely on an NCAA D1 title that season. In a hype debut for the Gophers, Brock would lose to Trent Hynek of Iowa State, but wouldn't lose again until his very last match of the season. In the 1999 NCAA heavyweight finals, Lesnar would lose to returning champion Stephen Neal of Cal State Bakersfield by a score of 3-2. Stephen Neal would go on to win a world championship in wrestling and play for nine years with the New England Patriots. Lesnar's loss to Neal would haunt him, and once again, Brock was motivated to never feel like that again. In his senior year, Brock Lesnar was truly now the poster boy for the Minnesota Gophers. Brock brought intrigue alone just by being a specimen on the mat, but he truly became a showman for the Gopher faithful. Lesnar was not afraid to be brash and knew how to play into the crowd when he went out and wrestled. Lesnar would speak his mind candidly for the media, and after, people would want to come and see him in person. Ultimately, though, he was focused on a national title, and at the end of the season would enter a legendary saga with Iowa's Wes Hand. Wes would strike first when he would beat Lesnar in the Minnesota-Iowa duel at the end of the season. Lesnar would respond by beating him at the Big Ten Championships weeks later. Finally, they would meet for a third time in the national finals. The match would go into double OT, and with Lesnar on bottom, all he had to do was escape to win. With 14 seconds left, Lesnar would sit out and get the escape to win his D1 NCAA title. After a lifetime of sacrifice, Lesnar had accomplished his greatest goal of being a D1 national champion. Now, he had to decide what to do next. A friend of Minnesota head coach Jay Robinson, who worked as a talent scout for what was at the time the World Wrestling Federation, later known as World Wrestling Entertainment, or WWE, had seen Brock win the national title and put in motion a place for Brock in the WWF. While Lesnar had other options post-collegiately, such as taking a run at the Olympics, thing was, Lesnar had been broke his entire life. From the childhood poverty he experienced in South Dakota to being a broke wrestler, trading everything for just glory, Lesnar wanted nothing more than to escape financial hardship and he knew the WWE was guaranteed money to do this. He would sign at the time the most lucrative development deal in the WWE, where he would be paid $250,000 per year. He would start training at the developmental territory for the WWE, the Ohio Valley Wrestling in Louisville, Kentucky. The developmental class Brock signed to was actually stacked with future WWE stars, including John Cena, Randy Orton, and Batista. After two years of performing there, Brock would be called up to the big leagues, and he would make his WWE debut on Monday Night Raw in March of 2002. It wouldn't take long for Brock to be known as the next big thing in WWE. Brock's larger-than-life appearance paired with his role as a heel made him a hit with the audience. By August that year, he would defeat one of the WWE's biggest stars of all time, Dwayne The Rock Johnson. to become the youngest undisputed WWE champion in history. Brock was skyrocketed to the top of WWE, taking down any other big names that year, such as the Hardy Brothers and The Undertaker. Preparing for the long haul, Brock would sign a new contract with the WWE in 2003 with a million dollar a year guarantee, putting him at the top of the pay scale for the WWE. Brock was now the highest paid WWE wrestler, but just as quick as he came into the promotion, he would leave it. While the money may be good, the lifestyle of a WWE superstar is incredible. Incredibly hard. What kind of injuries did you have? I've torn both of my knees up, severe back pain, ribs, neck issues. With constant travel, Brock was quickly feeling burnt out. Along with the demanding travel schedule, the stunts performed by wrestlers wear on the body fast, and it's not uncommon to see wrestlers turn to substances to escape the pain. This was the path Brock was going down, with an alcohol and Vicodin addiction forming, and he knew he had to get out before the lifestyle consumed him. A year after becoming the highest paid WWE wrestler, he would quit. Now in limbo, Brock wanted to use his fresh start to get back into actual competition rather than entertainment. Now we're gonna see Brock Lesnar out there. Been a, a heck of a deal for him. You know, professional wrestler, national wrestling champion at the University of Minnesota, local hero. For his next move, Brock would give the NFL a shot. 
Lesnar would try out for the Minnesota Vikings, and he would get invited to their training camp. Lesnar only played football his senior year of high school, but what he lacked in skill, he made up for physically. Lesnar would end up playing in multiple preseason games with the Vikings, but would end up being the last player cut on the roster. Brock would go back to searching for his next move. Brock was uninterested in returning to the WWE, as his relationship with them severed after leaving, and due to a non-compete clause he signed with the WWE, he could not work for any wrestling or MMA promotion in the US. Needing to stay afloat, Brock would start working for Japanese wrestling promotions from 2005 to 2007, where he reportedly would earn around $50,000 per match. After a year of back and forth legal hearings though, Brock would get his non-compete clause worked out with the WWE, and he would prepare for one of his biggest career pivots so far. In 2008, Brock would sign a one-fight contract with the UFC for $203,000. UFC owner Dana White and Brock both knew the value he could bring to the UFC. With his WWE fan base behind him, and the MMA fan base wanting to see if an entertainer could hang with real fighters. Brock would bring a ton of eyes with him. Brock would lose his UFC debut shockingly to Frank Muir, but Lesnar's involvement in the promotion was successful, and he would stay on it for more fights. By his third UFC fight, Brock would defeat Randy Couture to become the heavyweight champion of the UFC. Brock Lesnar could not only hang with real fighters, he could obliterate them. With the Lesnar UFC era in full effect, he would defend his UFC title twice and would have a total of seven fights before retiring from the UFC for the first time. Over those seven fights, Lesnar would receive around $2.3 million in just purse payouts from the UFC, but it's rumored that with sponsorships and pay-per-view payouts, he would earn around $3.5 million per fight. However, he still wouldn't receive his biggest UFC check until years later. Towards the end of his first UFC stint, Lesnar's health would repeatedly hinder the rollout of his fights. And at one point, Lesnar would find himself in the hospital fighting for his life. In 2009, it would be discovered that Lesnar had diverticulitis, a disease of the digestive tract that causes pouches to form on the colon. By the time Lesnar was diagnosed, the disease had gotten so advanced his colon was leaking matter into his abdominal cavity, and his immune system was depleted from attempting to fight this leakage it thought was an infection. Brock would need surgery immediately to close up his intestine. In 2011, Brock would have another rough bout with diverticulitis and would once again go under surgery. Brock would recover and make a comeback to the UFC, but he likely knew the risk was no longer worth the reward. One bad hit to the gut and he could easily be facing another major health crisis. After losing to Alistair Overeem, Brock would announce he was retiring from mixed martial arts. Quickly after retiring from the UFC, whispers of Lesnar's return to the WWE began circulating. Sure enough, after eight years away from WWE, Brock would return in April of 2012, hitting his signature F5 on John Cena to an eruption from the audience. Why Brock chose to return to WWE after shunning them almost a decade earlier is easy to answer money. Upon returning, the WWE would sign him to a one-year deal worth $5 million, more than all his UFC purses combined. The WWE knew Brock was an extreme asset to them and didn't want to lose him to scheduling like they had before. So along with this insane payout, he was only required to do three pay-per-view events within that year. His body was no longer being sacrificed the way it was in UFC. He was making unbelievable money and only had to work part-time. Brock was finally living life fully on his terms. Brock was a made man by this point and really had nothing else to prove. He spent the time since 2012 doing business with only the right people for the right money. Pretty much this equates to him staying with the WWE. He would maintain his contracts with the WWE until 2020 when he would momentarily retire. During this period, he would break The Undertaker's undefeated 21 match win streak and become a multiple time WWE and Universal World Heavyweight Champion. In 2016, the WWE would allow Lesnar to participate in a one-off UFC return fight. After five years away, he would face Mark Hunt as a co-headliner in the UFC 200, arguably one of the best UFC cards of all time. For his return, Lesnar would receive a fight purse of $2.5 million, making it easily among the biggest UFC payouts in history. When you think about it, that's half of his annual WWE salary in just one night. Lesnar would win this fight by unanimous decision, but the victory would later be overturned after Brock would test positive for banned substance. However, this drug screening didn't affect his standing with the WWE, as he was not even a full-time employee, and since this incident, he has remained solely in the WWE. Upon returning to WWE in 2021 after an extremely brief retirement in 2020, 
Brock now sported a new look in the ring that was more reflective of his current state in life. The next big thing was now Cowboy Brock. With the beard and long hair, paired with the cowboy hat and boots, Brock no longer had to play the heel persona and was now a face for the WWE. This fit perfectly for Brock, who had been on a wild ride his entire career and now in his mid-40s was in a much more peaceful space as a husband and father. Brock is still currently honoring what is said to be his final WWE contract and it looks like he may really be riding off into the sunset this time. Brock is still completing side missions, such as when he served as an honorary coach for the Minnesota Gophers wrestling team at a duel in 2020 to commemorate the 20th anniversary of his heavyweight NCAA a title. Brock lives an extremely private life, splitting time between residences in Minnesota and Saskatchewan, Canada. Brock has gone back to his roots, devoting most of his time to hunting and farming on his ranch in Canada, just as he did as a boy in Webster, South Dakota, but this time by choice. Today, Lesnar's estimated net worth is $25 million. By taking his natural talent, maximizing its potential through hard work, and effectively marketing his image, Brock Lesnar would not only escape generational poverty and reach his goals, but become the highest paid head heavyweight athlete of all time. Thanks for watching that. Hope you enjoyed it. If you have an idea for a video we should do next, let us know in the comments and be sure to subscribe.